Heroes. Robots. Dragons. Lend us your ears. And a huge thank you to all of our Patreons. Thank you to the Pit Fighters, the First Swords, and all of the Bright Stars. Truth and Courage. Hello and welcome today. We have the absolute pleasure, the honour of interviewing Cresto Cal. And yeah, we are very excited to be asking her so many questions about recent releases, your writing process, all your art as well, which is very unique. And yeah, so we're really looking forward to getting into that. But first of all, of course, thank you for giving us your time in what has looked like an incredibly busy last few weeks. <laughs> yes, yes, I've been on tour for the last um, couple of weeks. So yeah, I've been going all around into bookshops and schools and, <laughs> you know, have, having a, a good time um, doing that. Yes. So it has been busy, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I bet your signing yeah. hand is aching by now. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But it's so great meeting kids and teachers and just, you know, seeing everybody getting dressed up as Vikings or dragons or seeing that they're really getting into the Which Way books. And so that that's always such a lovely bit of the of the, yeah. um, of, of the job for me. So, yeah, I love it. I oh, love yeah. that part of the job. That sounds amazing. And I'm really looking forward to kind of picking your mind about your writing process. But before we get into that, would you be willing to give us a quick pitch on Which Way to Anywhere? OK, so Which Way to Anywhere and Which Way Round the Galaxy are um, the first two books in my uh, new book series. Yeah. And it's all about um, it's all about right here, right now, when magic, as we all know, really exists, uh, but it's just that it has to keep itself secret in modern times. Um, and it's about two sets of children, um, two sets of children who um, all have magical gifts. Um, but at the beginning of the book series, um, uh, yes, these, these, these are the heroes. Um, uh, uh, K2 and Isabel are from a magical family that is trying to keep its magic secret in a world that doesn't isn't very open minded about magic nowadays. And their mother has married the father of Theo and Mabel, who we think are from a non magical family. But <laughs> everybody has magic <laughs> in, in these books. Um, and uh, the two sets of children are sort of arguing at the beginning of which way to anywhere. The one thing they can agree on is their baby sister, Annie Peck, who's the baby sister of both sets of children. And magic doesn't normally come in in this, um, uh, it, 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 as you will know, until you're about 12 or 13. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. Um, but Ma Annie Peck already has a magical power which is magic that works on, on plastic. And she's not even two. So something very strange is going on. And then we discover what K2's magical power is. And it's such a cool, I mean, I'm assuming you guys do want to have a magical power, don't you? I mean, I mean always. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what's your magical power? <laughs> well, go first. Oh, it's, it's a hard one, isn't it? Well, my magical power maybe would be to to be able to clone myself so I can get a lot more done. That'd be great. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> Take more just, off of the to-do list. <laughs> I have to say, you're a teacher, aren't you? That's a tip. Yes, exactly. Teacher, yeah. <laughs> Marking done in one, one no, 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 no. yeah, you can have fun the other, but yeah. <laughs> and how about yours? I was actually thinking of something very similar. I was going to say slow time down, but uh, yes, we. <laughs> <laughs> okay, slow time down. In which case, I hope you're a force for good. If you can <laughs> yeah. slow time down. <laughs> 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 Uh, you can do all sorts of things you can slow time down well one of the kids has the most incredible magical gift k2 which is the gift of drawing maps that show the which ways or the crossing points between the worlds so a piece of paper has two sides on one side this kid k2 draws his fantasy map um, and the other side, he knows he draws somewhere he knows well, like at the kitchen, in his house. And then on both sides of the piece of paper, he draws an X. And that shows the wormhole or the which way where you can push through into uh, uh, the other world, which is <laughs> actually true. Yeah. Um, so an incredible magical gift. Um, uh 
I used to spend a lot of time as a kid, you know, Narnia, like pushing on the backs of water <laughs> yeah. to try and go to Narnia. Don't leave the snow behind her. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and this is a similar idea that um, K2, so then he can go to the fridge in his kitchen and push through into a, a fantasy world. And he keeps all his maps in this thing called an alternative atlas. Um, this is my sketchbook that I'll show you later, the alternative atlas, like this one. Um, and bad people, basically, bad people want to get hold of the kid who has this incredible Atlas gift um, because it saves so much time and money on space travel. Um, so it's about what happens when one of these bad people comes to try and steal the kid with the Atlas gift and accidentally steals baby Anapek, thinking, it's the kid with the gift. And then the two sets of children have to work together to rescue mm -hmm. baby Anna Peg. So, yeah, that's the plot, basically. Of what a pitch. Amazing. Pitch right to anywhere, <laughs> which is the first one in the series. Um, but it's about kids finding their magical gifts and alternative worlds. And it's a lot about space as well, because um, I, I love learning things and kids learning yeah. things as well as their yeah. reading. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a crazy journey where you definitely learn a lot and it is just wonderful. It transports you somewhere else. And uh, yeah, it's children's fiction, but I've read it and thoroughly enjoyed it as well. So <laughs> anyone can read and really enjoy. Um, well, I do that deliberately. I make it genu genuinely enjoyable for the adults as well as the kids. Um, so that it works on two levels, a bit like a lot of movies, like a lot of the animations nowadays, um, like House Train Dragon or, you know, Toy yeah. Story. Adults can genuinely enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, I think, because uh, I remember every book that was read to me by an adult. And I often say, go into schools and say, please, even if you're knackered, poor teachers, <laughs> I know you're knackered, <laughs> um, try and find some time um, to read aloud and parents as well. Because yeah. kids are often so much cleverer than their reading ability. Um, so if they're read aloud to, you know, it accesses their intelligence rather than, than their reading ability. Um, and so I think it's th that's why I make it genuinely enjoyable for the adult. Because if a book can make your, you know, your dad laugh or your mum cry or your teacher be interested you know the kid catches on and the kid yeah. thinks wow books are powerful things they have the power to make my dad laugh or you know so so I do do that deliberately make it genuinely enjoyable for the adults. It becomes like an experience altogether doesn't yeah. it and that's the important thing I think and I think you know these books that speak to people no matter what age they are they're always the books that stick with us for a long time. Yeah I hope so. <laughs> and so I think I know the answer to this from your passion talking already, but what is it? You've been writing for quite a few years now, and I was wondering, what is it that keeps you so passionate to carry on writing, coming up with new projects? I, I just see all the research about how a kid who reads, reads for pleasure is likely to be more economically successful, um, regardless of what social background. They're from. I mean, that we've got 20 years of research on that. Um, and, and, and so getting children, all children, reading for pleasure is a massive challenge when there's the best screen, the best telly, the best, the best screen ever, really. Um, yeah. uh, so for me, it's not just about telling stories. It's about telling stories that really do get children genuinely reading for pleasure. Um, and that's the real passion for me. That's that's the and that's why I pack the books full of pictures and make it feel like a very joyful, non-schooly kind of object. Um, but I'm always writing for kids' intelligence because kids um, are just as smart as ever they were, but maybe their attention span is a little bit shorter that, than, they, than it used to be. And they're used to very visual, they're used to screen and telly, so they're very visually literate. So I try and make the books feel like a play object and yeah. very exciting and very funny. And But that's the real passion for me, is getting a kid reading, reading for the joy of it. But stuff that really makes them think. Because uh, kids are so smart, you know, and and I'm I really do challenge them. I mean, they they don't realise it, you know. I put it as something that's just a bit of fun, and but 
you know, they're so smart. They pick up on everything, kids. Yeah. Um, so I'm really trying to make them think as well as um, a, a, as well as tell an enjoyable story and get them mm-hmm. reading for, for pleasure. I'm doing yeah, a lot yeah. of things all at once, really. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so you've got the visual aspect as well, because these books are filled with illustrations. And so I was wondering, when you start kind of creating these stories, does it begin with kind of thinking of the story or it, does it begin with the art for you? I'll start with an idea or a story. I, I, shall I? Sh- I'll show you. This is the very first picture in my sketchbook that I did of Hiccup. Yeah, <laughs> your sketchbooks are infamous. So uh, yeah, very very popular. Yeah. So this is the very first picture I did of Hiccup. Can you see wow. that? It's very small. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah, that's Hiccup and his father, <laughs> Stoic the Vast. Um, and that's just like a little scribbly kind of a drawing. Um, and, and so I I might start with the idea of a, of a kid who's having a bit of difficulty living up to being like their dad. Um, but then I suppose I think of it a bit like, (laughs) a bit like, and I'm going to show you also some pictures. This is a sketchbook of which way to anywhere. Um, so I'll start with the, the kind of, the characters. Um, this is me drawing the, the characters to start off with, um, just to get a sense of, of what they're like, of what the characters are like. And the drawing will give me a sense of, you know, I'll start kind of drawing this kid and realise, you know, I make her hair very, very scribbly and excitable. And I'll realise, okay, this is a disobedient kind of cheeky kind of a kid. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of trying to create, I think of myself, okay, a bit like Let's say writing a book is like creating a movie, but just all on your own. (laughs) So I'm out there creating the characters, doing the casting, doing the research, scouting out the locations, (laughs) (laughs) painting the sets. And, And that's what a sketchbook really is. So I'm, you know, I'm scouting out the locations. This is their house. I'll start drawing the house where they live, which is this falling down ancient old house, which has been built on a crossing of the ways, which you think is a crossing of the ways just in this world, but is actually a crossing of the ways to the other side of the universe. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting to to kind of, yeah, by, by doing that, or then up also in these big, this is a huge sketchbook, um, I'll start for which way to anywhere because it's about um, other worlds and I've got to create other worlds from scratch, um, kind of planets and landscapes that we've never seen before. I'll do lots of research into real locations. So these are some extraordinary hills in, Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think that's some, I think those are in, I think those are in America somewhere, stripy hills or, spotted lakes it's kind of sort of extraordinary uh things in this world that don't really feel like that they could be real but that's almost like location kind of um you know spotting it's like being a, a film director so i'll do all that uh, and if i'm writing about vikings i might do masses of research into vikings and i'll find out some incredible fact like um, you know, I'll find out a, a fact about Vikings having a swimming competition in which the last person back is the winner in full body armor because the last person back is the bravest person. Mm-hmm. And that might give me uh, an idea for the story. Um, uh, or I'll find out that Vikings skied and there was a real, this is real history, there was a Viking baby king who was surrounded by enemies and his bodyguard skied him to safety. Um, And they still hold a race in Scandinavia to commemorate that. But that would give me a whole idea for a plot in How to Cheat a Dragon's Curse. So the sketchbooks and the research, which is often very visual for me, you know, I'll do all that before I even start beginning to construct a plot or beginning to write you know there's a lot of designing characters kind of 
really getting into the world, you know, if it's Bronze Ages, I'm doing loads of research into, um, you know, Bronze Ages and Iron Ages and what, you know, magic, what people believed about in it, about magic. Um, and that all takes place for a very long time, even before I start writing the story. Wow. It's just total immersion, isn't it? You just really throw yourself in the deep end. I yeah, absolutely and love I, that. And, and people don't necessarily think that. They think because you're writing yeah. fantasy, you're making everything up. And of course, you know, this really is fantasy. You know, Vikings may not have had dragons, <laughs> may not have had dragons, you know. Um, but it's fantasy that's grounded <laughs> in reality. You know, Vikings did believe that dragons yeah. were real and the dragon ships, you know, they they were dragon ships for a reason because Vikings thought that dragons were real. So the fantasy comes out of something true. And I think that makes it more believable to the kid or indeed the adult who is yeah. reading with. <laughs> so is your brain constantly going? You're just inspired by basically anything you can pick up and and that transforms itself into your sketchbook then into ideas or do you find that you do have times where you can kind of relax and and take some some low time oh <laughs> not a lot of time <laughs> you guys are teachers you will know this <laughs> yeah no i'm i'm busy a lot of a lot of the time because um yeah because there's a lot to do and partly because um, kids grow up in you. So you you do have to, you can't, like with an adult, if you write a book and an adult loves a book um, and then the next book in the series or the next book doesn't come out for three years, the adult is still the same adult. Yeah. And they'll still like the same kind of book. The kid, a kid in three years, grows a lot, yeah? yeah, and they might not like the same things that they liked three years ago. So, so unless you write the next one fairly swiftly after the previous one, you know, you, you you're all constantly remaking your child audience. If you said, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's fairly. Full on being a children's book writer. Yeah, so, it must be. And all the all the book tours you've been on as well must be so much fun, but also, you know, so busy as well. And you're going around schools. And I saw on your Instagram that you've been going around schools on your book tour uh, the last couple of weeks. And it just looks like so much fun. It's so much fun, but it's also so um it's really important because yeah. the kids have so much um you know, they they're, they're They've got a lot to do. <laughs> do, do. <laughs> There's a lot expected of kids nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I think in the, in the, in the curriculum and everything. And then they, they've also got all this screen, this wonderful screen. So an ad, a, an author again, lots of research. And an author coming into your school can make a huge difference. Um, it can excite a kid to try a book. You know, films and telly are just magically beamed into their heads without them having to make an effort. Whereas a book can be harder and, you know, if even if a kid has a learning difficulty, it, it can even come to represent something that makes them feel stupid, even though they're so smart. Yeah. And so you have to end, overturn that. And an and a author coming into a school can really help getting a kid maybe trying a book or, or making them think it might be fun. And so that's a really important part of our job. Um, and then I've also... I'm involved in, I, I think that every every kid should have a primary school that has a library in it. So I've been very involved in trying to get, you know, libraries for primaries um, yeah. and, and a school should be, you know, it, that shouldn't be something that schools that have less money, um, because at the moment schools that have, you know, in des disadvantaged areas are twice as likely not to have a school library. And so... I've been doing a lot of work to trying to do that as well, help out with that. And we're making progress with that, by the way, for the first time, really excitingly. There's the Libraries for Primaries campaign is actually opened a thousand school libraries in, in three oh, that's years. That's amazing. Yeah, what a good cause. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot, there's a lot going on.
being a bonus book writer, but there's a lot going on being teachers as well, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone's busy, aren't they? But uh, I, I showed uh, my class this week some of your videos on your YouTube channel, and we were oh, looking yeah. through your sketchbook, and they were talking about how to be inspired. And they have lots of questions to ask you, so I've got a Go few questions it. from from my class, and uh, maybe, Will, you can you can supplement them with some of your questions as well. But the yeah. first one was, what, what inspired you to be an author? Did, what, did you want to be an author when you were... Uh, in year three, which my class are, or did you, were you a bit older? Well, I did when I was in year three, but I really, <laughs> I really struggled with the handwriting and the spelling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually, I really struggled with the sitting still. I was a real, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was in trouble a lot because I, I was very, yeah, I, I, <laughs> we a lot of things, you know, when I was little were not dying. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I I struggle with sitting still and and handwriting and spelling mm. and 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 so I didn't know that being a writer was something I could be um, because I thought being a writer was about, about your handwriting and your spelling yeah. and, and and so. Um, so I really would have loved to have known that that's what, because I loved reading. Um, uh, but I, I had a lovely teacher in year three called Miss Mellows who gave me, a, she could see how discouraged I was getting. And she gave me one book where I could write for 15 minutes um, where it didn't matter about the handwriting and the spelling. Thank you, Miss Mellows. Can I just say, <laughs> I can go back in time and thank Miss Mellows. That was really great for me. Because for the first time, I was able to write just for enjoying it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, they'll they'll love that answer as well. Because a lot is a lot of our talk is about spellings and handwriting. But you know, like you said, that's not being a writer, is it? That's well, just being no. good at handwriting or a good speller. And of course, you know, they do have to learn. You know, I'm not saying you know they have to learn that. Yeah. Of course, um, everybody has to. But it's it's about saying it's not a race, and I think kids often compare themselves and then sometimes their pride gets involved and they then yes. they oh well you know work isn't really for me you know that it can become very quickly you know um it because it can be I know from experience so discouraging when some yes. kids seem to find it so easy but you you know so I'd like to say that it you know it, it really isn't a race um and and tr please try not to get discouraged because it's about your ideas really in the end and yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite book you've written? I'm always trying to get better. So I think it's um I hope it's it's which way round the galaxy, which is my latest one. But I have got a real soft spot for uh the last one in the How to Train Your Dragon series because I answered all these questions that um that I've been asking through the series. <laughs> yeah. Really, and I had all these secrets that I've been keeping. So that was a really yeah. lovely one to write. Oh, yeah. brilliant. And uh, what's what was your favourite dragon when you're writing the House Train Your Dragon series? Did you have a favourite dragon? This is very difficult because, I, I mean, I've in fact bought a, a whole book of dragons called The Incomplete Book of Dragons because, <laughs> you know, dragons can are never like, be complete. It can never be complete. Find them all, no. No. Because they're like they're hiding. There's lots yeah. that are hiding. We can't find them. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. And but but this is all sorts of different. You know, dragons like hypno hypno monks. I would love to write about a hypno monk. Actually, that reminds me of that one. Don't look into their eyes. Um, stink dragons, and then there's the huge dragons. Often kids like the really big scary ones like Woden's nightmares and um but i've got a real soft spot for hiccups little dragon who, <laughs> to, who's the very <laughs> disobedient hunting dragon um in the books he has a hunting dragon and a riding dragon and in the films they sort of muddled the two together um but i've got a real soft spot for the the, little, <laughs> the toothless yeah <laughs> yeah mm. Yeah, I'm William, gonna... I won't. I won't steal all the questions, so I, I'll let you ask one. I think a really important point you've touched on is reading for pleasure as a child, and also how that that leads into reading for pleasure as you get older. And so that leads me to ask, what was the first book you remember really loving? Yeah, um, 
I, I loved re- reading lots of different types of books and I read lots of, I, I often say to kids, I read lots of comics like Batman and because I was very visual. And um, the first book that I really loved was a, a book called The Ogre Downstairs about some kids who find a magic chemistry set and each of the, was by Diana Wynne Jones and who wrote Howl's Moving Castle, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Series. Um, and it was about some kids who find a magic chemistry set and one of the chemicals brings your toys to life and another one, you know, makes you fly and one of the chemicals. And I loved that book. And and interestingly, actually, that was po- possibly because in which way to anywhere, in which way around the galaxy, it's about a, a blended family. It, it's about uh, some children who've been put together in a family um, uh, you know, because the parents were divorced. And so they put put together in, in a new family. And it's about the children working together to, you know, to to form this, this, this new family, you know. And actually now I come to think of it, the ogre downstairs, that was a similar kind of thing. And 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 when I was writing, I suppose, which way to anywhere, I thought this is a situation that children are often in. And actually it's really nice to have a book that tells that story in it in a glorious fun yeah, yeah joyful adventure kind of a way and that's what i hope is happening in which way around the galaxy is that and which way to anywhere is that the children are a finding out what their magical gift is and and that's really important i'm trying to present children with unexpected heroes so you know, one of the children, like Mabel, is quite shy and she's not like, I'm the most important person. And she, but I'm trying to say, she's got a special magical gift. I want every child to find their own magical gift, even though they might not be the most obvious hero. Um, and I and I also wanted to tell a story that, I, yes, I, this is just occurring to me, <laughs> just as we're talking, that I suppose happened in the yoga downstairs where it was yeah. um, some children learning to live together in a family and I and I in a new family and I think that is something that yeah as I say lots of children go to and I often as a child and as an adult go to books looking not for just for fun but for a little bit of wisdom as well Mm -hmm. a little bit of wisdom and Mm -hmm. so I suppose that's what I'm trying to do in my books is give give kids a little bit of wisdom um yeah yeah and there's definitely a lot of wisdom in here and that leads to my next question is about the characters as you've been talking about they're they're the heart of the story and so was there a particular character in which way around the galaxy that you really loved writing about or really really loved kind of bringing to life i'm gonna cheat a bit because i genuinely love writing all of the characters for different reasons. I'm probably most <laughs> I'm probably most like if I'm I'm <laughs> there's a, a bounty hunter called a Rizabel and Anna Beck. <laughs> the very confident, chatty is a bird, you know, and, and in the dragon books, kamikaze, those girl heroes are possibly what you would say I was most like. Um, but I do I do love getting into the head of, of Mabel, who's this, and I really admire characters like Mabel or like K2 or Hiccup in the How to Train Your Dragon books, who are the kind of kids who, who are a bit shyer sometimes and not necessarily as, but who who do who are brave in a really in a quieter kind of a way and mm-hmm. who have that gift of empathy and of knowing what it feels like to be somebody else and who stand up in a brave kind kind way for what is right and i'm thinking of mabel does this and in the how to how in which way around the galaxy and hiccup very much does that in in how to train your dragon so I do, I do love, I do love the thing of, of trying out being different characters. I mean, that is one of the great things about being a writer and being a reader as well, is that you get to get into somebody else's head. And that's, mm. that's a very good thing to 
try and do, I think, to try and see things from other people's point of view and imagine that you might be them. Um, so I do love writing all of the characters, but I have got a soft spot for Anna Peck, the baby, who is very, very redoubtable. <laughs> so I love that you see yourself in the characters as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she's a very strong character, um, Anna Peck. Um, and, and when they, they ring Anna Peck, Anna Peck in Which Way Around the Galaxy gets accidentally left behind. Um, uh, and they have to ring her to say she's in trouble defending the house. And she says, is it in my cereal? She says, she's this very strong, <laughs> confident little baby. Um, and I do particularly like writing those characters, those strong, yeah. strong female characters, which when I was growing up, you didn't have that many. You had Pippi Longstocking maybe, um, but you didn't have so many strong female characters. So I really like writing those. Yeah. And there's definitely a whole range of characters for any type of personality in these books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> and another one from my, ch from my class is, uh, what is the hardest thing about being an author and what is the best thing about being an author? Lots of them are considering it. So they wanted to hear the pros and the cons. Oh, that's yes. As a, mm. yes, it's, it's not, it's not easy being an author. Um, so it is something that you have to, and it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult to make a, make a living as an author. I mean, I want to be realistic uh, about this. I want to present mm. this to kids. This is something that you have to do because you love it. You know, it's not if you, you know, there are other things to do. <laughs> there are other ways of, of, you know, there are steadier jobs, put it like that. <laughs> there are <laughs> steadier jobs and a lot of authors have to have another job in order to, you know, to um, survive as an author. Um, so I want to pa paint that realistic to, ki to kids, but it is the most wonderful job. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous job. And when you get a kid saying, oh, your, my, your, your book's got me into reading, um, you know, that is so exciting. I love that. And it is a bit, I think it's not unlike being a teacher in a way. You you do have an effect on so many people and and that is very heartwarming, you know, and mm. and and you also get to learn from kids in a way, you know, because kids have a lot to teach the adults as well as the adults. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you can learn from their hopefulness and their um lack of prejudice and their, um, you know, their hope for the future and their creativity. And because you're trying to write for kids, you're getting into their mindset. Um, and I think that's a real privilege. That's a lovely thing to be able to do. Um, so I can think of a lot of good things. Um, uh, but, you know, but hard that, you know, it is hard. It's hard work. But then lots of jobs are hard work. Most jobs yeah. are hard work in a good, fun way. I mean, I don't mind. It's, you know, I don't mind working hard when it's good fun. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Just look at my list. You can ask another one where while I look at my, my list. So uh, well, answered gonna, so far. It's one of those things that when you come up with a new amazing project, people are always asking what is next because they just want more. And so I've got a question of what is, what project have you got going next? Is there anything you can tell us? Um, well, I'm writing another one in, in this series. Um, but I think that's about all. <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm I'm I have that to look forward to. I'm a terrible at secrets, but I have been told <laughs> very sternly that I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> Other than I am writing the last one in this series, because all of the children have to find out what their gifts are. Um mm. uh you know, he, he he you know, in in this next in this one, which way around the galaxy, Theo, who's um we you know, the first one we found out what K2's gift um was, and in this one we find out what Theo's gift is. They have to take this cute little magical creature back to its home planet. But along the way, 
Theo to find out what his gift is, but the other two, I'm just writing what their magical gifts are. Really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be in, in the third one in this series, but I'm not allowed to tell you anymore. <laughs> well, I've <laughs> to find out. <laughs> and do, do you have like multiple sketchbooks going on at the same time or do you just focus on one? No, I have massive, I have loads and loads and loads of these sketchbooks. Um, I really would encourage kids to keep, because you always think you'll remember your ideas, but, yeah. I, but I will have, I mean, you know, I, even just here, um, you know, yeah, that, that's what, that's, um, that's a picture book that never, and it's where, where it never play poker with strangers. That was never published. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got some great pictures in it. Um, but yeah, no, I have. See, loads. that's what I really want to read even more now. <laughs> <laughs> She'd read a picture book called Death of Playbook. <laughs> it was very We moral. need a petition. Petition. <laughs> Come on. That's brilliant. <laughs> you see, that's a book that's never never been published and my writing shed is full of books that haven't been published yet you know and full of ideas because you have to kind of when you think of ideas you have to immediately put them in because you think you'll remember them but then mm. then you don't and you know you forget and life moves on so um so i always say you know keep all of your books written down in a sketchbook um because then you might come back to them um which way to anywhere um I wrote that, the idea for that, about 25 years ago before I even wrote How to Train Your Dragon. And my oh, husband wow. spent the last 25 years saying, what about that book about the alternative atlas? I really <laughs> have that idea. <laughs> Why haven't you written that yet? That's brilliant. So they can be recycled at any time in your oh, life. Yeah, you can bring yeah. them out at any time. Yeah. And this all, yeah, every sketchbook has loads. I've got loads of books, idea in, in ideas in this even in this one sketchbook, yes, I, you know, Star Baby. What happened to Star Baby? That was an idea for a <laughs> book that never happened. And, you know, so, so yes, that so, yeah, I have loads and loads of sketchbooks on the go at the, at the same time. Because our dad's an author as well. So, and he's, oh, really? He, he'll wake up in the middle of the night and he has to go write it. If he has an idea, he'll have to go write the idea down. Otherwise, he will 100% forget it. And then the whole next day is ruined because he's just trying to think about this one idea. Is he, is he, does he write children's books or adults' books? He writes adult fantasy. Really? Yeah. Well, What's it's one? a lot of it's like Viking stuff. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. What, what's your dad's name? His name's John Gwynn. Wow. So, if you like Lord of the Rings, that kind of thing, then um, that, that, that might be your, your jibe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A, a, a man after my own heart. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's all about Vikings. I mean, Vikings mm -hmm. are incredible. I mean, there's something just incredible about Vikings. Imagine setting out to see. I mean, I spent a lot of my childhood on the sea, so I know how brave this is. Yeah. Setting out to sea with no way of contacting the lifeguard or the coast guard or, yeah. and no longitude, you know, you know, and no sense of whether you were going to hit land or not. I mean, the astonishing bravery of that. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. 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 We don't really think about that side of it too much, do we? But if you really think about how these people felt, you know, embarking all these amazing adventures and all sorts like that, it's, it's incredible what humans can really do. The yeah. urge to explore yeah. is so ingrained in human beings. It's so, because that's what we, that's what we had to do. Um, you know, the sea roads, you know, that those sea roads, I mean. The whale road, yeah. Whale road. <laughs> that's probably your dad. <laughs> ah, the we, we we do Viking reenactment as well, so um, I do. so we've got all all the gear and a little bit of an idea, but uh, yeah, I mean, we <laughs> we were teaching Vikings in year five a few years ago, and um, oh, and yeah. one of the one of the children in the other classes, she gave me a note saying, "My uncle's a Viking. Could you two fight?" So I said, "Yeah, that's fine. That's sure. That's sure. Uh, no problem." And anyway, he I got an email from her uncle saying, can I come in and can we do a duel in front of everyone? 
So we did a Viking day and he came in and we just did this off the cuff fight in front of a hundred children. And it was, I felt like I was at Troy or something. It was crazy. Yeah. It was, the kids have, loved it. Did he have a beard as well? Yeah. A big beard. I can't really grow a proper Viking beard, but um, our dad has a, has a very big one. But, uh, <laughs> he, 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 he put me to shame, this man. Yeah. But yeah, no, no, you got the you got the beard. I think that would. That's right. Yeah. There's a, a few wisps, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, Vikings were very, you know, Vic- combs were a big deal mm. for Vikings. Mm-hmm. They yeah. really cared, and um, there was a lovely thing in a Viking exhibition I thought re- recently saw recently with people complaining that you know they were too clean, and all the women <laughs> loved them because they were always combing them. <laughs> 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 A comb was a big deal. Yeah, if you've got a bone comb, then uh, then you're winning, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have someone to look out for. And they bathed a lot. Yeah, this was mm. the complaint. They bathed too much and they combed their hair too much. <laughs> That's all the women thought that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those historical gems are just wonderful, and it has been wonderful, really, kind of diving into your writing experience and your passions. And I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of the day and what is as you said an incredibly busy time uh thank you for spending it answering our questions it's been a a complete pleasure it really has been a total pleasure and um yeah and uh yes have happy happy teaching i'm i'm sure you're all you're both very busy too (laughs) thank you so much for the books and uh, yeah we're so grateful to have just even more amazing books to read and my kids love them and yeah teaching my class and talking about your books has definitely opened their eyes to some new ways to be creative and inspired them so i like you know thank you for that as well as for the amazing books and thank you for coming on the channel it's been such a pleasure to chat with you Really yeah, lovely to talk to you too. Okay. Well, can't wait to see what happens next. And uh, yeah, very best of luck with everything. And take care. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Encourage. <laughs> see you later. Take care.